screen with you all and hope it's can you um maybe people could just kind of give a thumbs up if they can see the slides i can't see absolutely i can't see everybody but jen can yeah see. we're all good i think all yeah good. brilliant um so today um we are going to be looking at moving to an online model of training delivery so you might be moving to an online training delivery for lots of different reasons which we'll discuss but also if you've already been running some online training this could just be really useful in terms of some tips um, and sharing different kinds of methods and tools and resources that we can all use um, so oh, i'm trying to move my slides along they don't seem to be moving oh here we go so a bit about me um, i'm marie as jen said um, i've got quite a lot of years experience in education community development youth work um, a lot of which was as a further education lecturer so using quite a lot of digital resources in in that context um, i've been delivering and assessing um, all different kinds of training and learning uh, including using e-learning uh, systems um, i'm the digital content coordinator at mindwaves really small charity and they're just fantastic um, and you can go tweet us and we've got a blog as well so if you go to twitter that's a, the best place to find out more about us um, and i also run a um i'm a music tutor and i have just during lockdown had to move all my business online so yeah i found out i that i didn't know because you know you don't know what you don't know <laughs> so i found i've had a steep learning curve like i think a lot of us have had recently so i want to find out a bit about you unfortunately there's loads of us which is great but it, it kind of means we can't find out exactly about all your backgrounds and stuff but i would just like to find out um you know generally what situation everybody's kind of in so i'm going to put up a poll which is hopefully going to launch oh it is it's working um so the poll is about where you're at what online training at the moment so which of the following describes you or your organization's position so you should be able to vote in the poll some devices it's a bit trickier so you can even just stick in the chat maybe a comment about um what your what your current situation is so you or your organization have you recently moved to online methods of training due to the COVID measures that we've all had to undertake? <laughs> online training was already part of your work before the measures. I think number one is already like the predominant one. Um, and you've got no experience online training yet, but hoping to implement some. And you might not want, you know, the reason for implementing the online training might not because of COVID, it might just because your organisation has some ideas that you feel would work better in that format. Great. So I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. Share the results. Yeah, so I think obviously recent months have just had such a big impact on all of us in the voluntary sector. Um, and especially in terms of the capacity we have um you know maybe we're already in in funding climates and things like that if you're already struggling with capacity um you know it's, it's so difficult um but there are loads of there are loads i know this is really cheesy but there are loads of opportunities when it comes to um using online resources methods all the rest of it so that's really good for me to know and i'm going to get rid get rid of the poll now hopefully that's disappeared now um so next i want to my slides aren't moving very quickly people so i'm trying to tell you about digital technology and i can't even move my slides um i don't know why it's not moving it's sticky control. slides oh there we go it's, it's working now so forgive me if that does happen um during today so aims for today um, we're going to look at the basic principles and types of online learning just to give us a wee bit of background on why we might want to use it. We're going to explore learner motivations and needs because the, the key here is the word learning. Online is how we're doing it, but we need to know about what, what we want the learners to take from it. And to do that, we're going to look at processes, tools and the environment 
And that's the three main issues we have to consider when we're designing the training. And then I've got some tips for anybody hosting or organizing online training. Um, you might be a facilitator, you might be somebody who's you know, setting it up for your participants. Um, you might be involved in the background of it. There's all different kind of things you might be doing. So um, hopefully have some tips for different aspects um, of our work. So first of all, let's explore our understanding of online learning. So what I want to say as well is please um, just take comfort in the fact that you've probably already over the past few months learned, you know, you've learned a huge amount through necessity. And I think with some of the existing stuff we've already been doing, um, you, you will be able to build something that your learners can use. And also, you know, you, this, is, this is all new to us and I think learners are very forgiving at the moment. <laughs> you know, whether you're running a community training course, whether you're running something more formal, you want to run something formal that's accredited, whatever it is, everybody does understand where we're at at the moment. Um, so don't be too hard on yourself about this. We're in the new normal and we need to, we're all thinking out of the box. So what method, let's just do this a kind of show of hands so that you can all see, if you have a look around your screen, um, you might be able to see um, what people think. So this is the kind of things you might have already done. Um, so you can stick in the chat, yes, I've tried this, or I'm not having much success with this, whatever it is, um, or just put your hands up. So the first thing is using things like this, like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, all these kind of Anybody been using using this kind of stuff already? Either to access training or de deliver meetings, speak to your service users or MD that you usually would meet up with in person. Yeah, and also, yeah, you can do a wee thumbs up or a wee wave on your um, screen as well. Um, what about cloud-based file sharing? So that means things like, you know, using a drive like Google Drive, where you can upload documents and share them with people. Um, I've been doing that quite a lot because of having to share, because I do music lessons, so I haven't shared things like sheet music and things like that. Um, closed or private groups on social media, Facebook groups, WhatsApp, um, Instagram, anything like that. I know a lot of youth organisations have been doing that and had quite a lot of success. Live broadcasts, has anybody been doing, um, you know, Facebook Live or going on to, um, some people have been going on doing, you know, arts organisations have been doing things like, I know Sound Lab have been doing like singing and beatboxing tutorials, things like that, um, that everybody can access. So some people have been doing live broadcasts. Um, recorded material. So some, I've seen some organisations making videos on YouTube. Um, sometimes it's just to chat to people and sometimes it's not to deliver any training content. It might just be to keep in touch with people and to help them. A lot of organisations as well have been using things like YouTube, Facebook, even just to say like, you know, are you all okay? What can we do to help you? Because our jobs are actually changing what we're doing for service users. People who were maybe previously on courses, we're now delivering food to them. We're now sending them um, packs to keep their family active. We're trying to get them funding for um, getting access to online services. So there's all sorts of reasons why we're keeping in touch with people. Anybody just been making phone calls? Old fashioned phone calls, which we've all forgotten to do because we think we need to do Zoom calls. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and um, anybody been have, having to send things out by post so that people have got the information they need, whether it's for training or other reasons? Well, probably not quite so much. I don't know, email probably counts as kind of mail as well, doesn't it? Um, or town crier, carrier pigeon, smoke signals, whatever. But yeah, that, that's good to kind of have a wee think about. So for a lot of you, this symbol will be what comes to mind when you hear about online learning. Um, open university, that's the kind, of, the, the kind of one that everybody goes straight to. And it's been around for a long time before digital technology even existed. So the general concept of online learning um, so it's not all about digital um, because 
even before we had the, the technology that we've got now, um, you know, there was correspondence courses as early as the late 19th century. So people were getting delivered, um, you know, booklets and um, things like that so that they could, um, you know, read about stuff and study it. So it's not a new, a new thing. Um, we've got a lot of things that are self-paced. So that means that you can access materials. So it might be through a website. It could be through things like Google Drive that we were talking about earlier on, um, where you can just go and get the materials. Um, and that's kind of thing that the Open University would do. You can log in and you can download things from certain units. And then when you're ready, you can engage with their assessment process. Um, so that's self-paced. I think it's called asynchronous learning, um, which I've just learned about recently. Um, Real-time group learning, so this is what we're doing now. We're all together. We've all got a common goal at this exact time. Um, so usually that would be online meetings, workshops, discussions. Um, and you can do real-time things in Messenger as well. I personally would find that quite hard, but you, you can um, do real-time discussions um, in um, text as well. Sometimes we use a mixture of these, which is probably common. It's probably similar to what, how you've been engaging with people recently. You're probably doing a whole mixture of different forms of engagement. So that's called hybrid learning, where maybe people will do, they'd have some workshops like this, and then they'd maybe go away and do a bit of reading or watch a video, and then they'd maybe come back and you might discuss it next time. Um, you might, um, you know, send them voice messages on your, um, closed group with some, or oh, just um, found out about this really good thing that relates to our training. So there's loads of things that you can you can mix and match. You don't have to just say this is my online method and that's what I'm doing and that's it. Um, flipped learning again, that's not really this isn't doesn't need to be digital. That's a concept. It's kind of about efficiency as well because it depends on the group as well. I mean, there's a lot of groups I've worked with that this just wouldn't work. Um, it's where learners take responsibility for kind of digesting the content. So at first they maybe get, like, you know, they get the materials first, and um, whether it's videos, um, you know, directing them to websites, maybe you've created something already. They've got time to go and have a look at that. And maybe in a couple of weeks time, you say we all get together. And actually the time together, like, so today I'm trying to, tell you something and hopefully we'll have some discussions about an issue and we're learning about it right now but the idea is that this time would be if I had given you all the information first and then we'd all come back here it would be more like troubleshooting and um, support like what did you think about that I don't understand this what does that mean so that's a different way to use it and um, learner management systems we don't really need to go into too much but if down the line your organisation was wanting to, you know, share, it could be just sharing information that people might want to know, but you want to do it in an interactive way. Um, you can create um, online training modules in um, which people can log into. Mostly you would need to outsource that to other companies. Um, so it would be part of a, a big project, but because of the funding that's become available due to COVID, there might be opportunities, you might think, you know, that might be a medium to long term opportunity for your organisation. And the MOOCs, um, massive open online courses, which probably don't apply to any of us being in the Scottish voluntary sector, would maybe unlikely to be delivering them. Um, a lot of big universities and stuff use them now, they're free. Anybody can access them, all the materials are out there. There's wee quizzes online. Um, you might have to. It, you know, people here might have done them. It's a great, it's, it's all about kind of, it's a democratic way of learning. It promotes equality. Um, and it just brings up the question as well. Yeah, we're not probably going to be creating MOOCs. Um, I'm certainly not even got a fraction of the knowledge to even contribute to that. But um, do you want your, the materials that you're sharing and the information you're sharing, do you want that to be available to a closed group of people? For example, maybe you're doing a, a course about health and well-being with a women's group you probably are just sharing that with that group yeah 
um, if it's a community group, but you or if but if your organisation's got a national um, remit, you might want to just you might want to be getting knowledge out there for every, as many people as possible to have. So you might not be doing a massive online open online course, but it's just to get you thinking about is this closed? This is for a specific group of people, or is this stuff we want to get out there and promote? So why are the models so popular? And they're all becoming very popular. Sometimes they're popular because they're a bit trendy. They're, 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 there's a lot of buzzwords about and a lot of jargon, jargon, and especially in education, we tend to experience a lot of that saying, oh, here's a new thing. Do it because it's new and it's, it's the thing in the moment. But there's so many meaningful reasons to do online learning, even if it's not just reacting to the current situation breaks down traditional barriers to learning, whether that's to do with, um, you know, things like geographical barriers, if you're in a remote area, which a lot of you might have already, I'm sure you have already experienced that, if you're in rural areas and um, trying to engage with people that are on courses or service users, um, gaining qualifications whilst working, so if you're in education, social work, community development, um, if you want to formalize some of your learning and get certain accreditation. You have to do it while you're working, don't you? Um, studying whilst children are young and, you know, especially when on, when distance learning first started out, this was, an this was an opportunity for women to get more equal access as well to the, the world of learning, really. Um, solution for mature learners who maybe um, they want to change career or they want to just learn something new and they feel motivated to do that or they maybe didn't have the kind of access to education when they were younger that they would have liked um, and it can be useful for health reasons as well um, for if you have chronic illness um, or, or mental health difficulties it can be a really good way especially the self-paced aspects of it can be really useful so there's loads of reasons why people would want to do it and it's, as I said, it's been around for like a long time before digital. Here's some early um, clips of the Open University. It's been around since, um, I think it's like 1970, or maybe even a bit before that. Um, and, you know, this was probably really innovative. This would have been really innovative then. There's somebody watching a video and taking some notes. And the principles are, a lot of the principles are still the same. It's not successful because of online. It's successful because it gives people flexibility. It provides support because not only do you get that self-paced stuff, but back then they would have been able to phone tutors. They would have had set times where they would have phone calls. They would have had written correspondence. Um, they would have got sent all the materials through their letterbox. Um, so there's loads of reasons. Um, convenience, again, if you're working, if you've got small children, if you, especially back then in terms of, unfortunately, um, the Equality Act, despite its existence, people still are obviously, and you will all know this from your, the work that you do, people are still experiencing barriers to different kinds of establishments. So it provided them access and convenience to actually participate, um, which back then would have been even more difficult than it can be now. Um, and specific and focused learner motivations because if Mature students tend to be coming with a real specific desire. They want to earn more money. They're bored in their job. Um, they they want to. Um, they didn't have the experience they wanted at school, and they just want to get some qualifications for their own satisfaction and fulfilment. So there's loads of reasons why um, adults want to learn, um, and I think it's that motivation and having that goal that also makes it successful because probably working with different kind of learners than when I came out of school and went, oh, what will I do? I'll pick that or I'll go and speak to this person. They can help, they can tell me what to do. Um, it's it's different, it is different for adults a lot of the time. Um, and when I say adults, I mean, I mean, even mean people that are like in their early twenties are, are going back and, and using things like the OU. So reasons for it, we've kind of spoken about why. So. We've gone through the ones about the open uni. Also, it's a profitable business model. That is why people use it as well, because it's, it's 
something that people want and they can sell it basically as well, which I know we're not doing. Um, and there's some really good values in there about inclusion, equality and lifelong learning, which I know that we will, all, everybody in this group will share as well. Um, and social change, it started because people started saying, no, I, I want access to this. And, you know, the re research and, and things, things that we knew about society changing and people want more equality in family life. Um, academia was probably starting to become kind of more democratic and less formal then as well. So us right now, yeah, we do want to offer flexibility and support to all our learners or service users. We always want to do that. And we share, I know that everybody here will share these values. Um, social change, yes, but not the same kind of social change. We're in the middle of a pandemic and there's a lot of necessity and urgency. So we've not had the time to develop a nice business model and like test it out on different people and pilot things which I'm sure the, the Open University do with all their different courses that they um, establish and um, have loads of time to get it all accredited and they've got those, they have those systems in place. They have been doing that for years, but we, we don't have those systems in place. Um, we're doing, we're doing like new jobs to a certain extent a lot of the time as well. So although loads of the things are really valuable, we are in a very different situation. But hopefully we can make it work um, for our organisations, for ourselves and for obviously our participants. So immediate reasons, you might have been running um, workshops and things already. Now you can't run them in person. Online is really the only solution. You've maybe got practice communities where people need CPD um, and they might need CPD in relation to COVID and how things are changing as well. Um, have you got people that are midway through something and you're like, how are we going to deal with this? Um, you've got new information to share about health and safety. You need to get people online and they don't have the skills. Um, and you might be thinking, actually, do you know what? Our online engagement has worked really well and we want to expand it. So, you know, there's loads of different reasons. So. I, don't, I feel like I've been kind of talking quite a lot. So what I'll do is I'll go through this next bit and then I'm going to see if Jen could maybe put us in, um, into breakout rooms. And I'm going to do something a bit earlier than I thought I was going to. Um, so before we actually design any course, whether it's online or not, we need to understand how people learn. Um, and there's loads of different theories of learning. We don't need to go into all the academic detail of it. Um, but I've, I've got a quote from Sir Ken Robinson there. Um, He's an education specialist. He's done TED Talks and all the rest of it. And he's like, we have to recognize that human flourishing is not a mechanical process, it's an organic process. So even if we develop all these great courses and great systems and we've got interactive quizzes and everything's all pinging and bells and whistles, at the end of the day, we're working with people and they have all kind of different needs. They're coming at learning with all different kinds of experiences. So we need to understand those. Um, so yeah, take online out the equation for now. Um, what are we offering and why do these specific group of people need it? Um, and then we can look at why online is important. So we've got a behavioural approach. So um, people that are in this kind of camp, and it's not about saying that there's one this approach and then this approach and you have to pick one. There's, there's kind of ideas from each approach that might help you think about how to motivate your learners. So behaviourists, they really believe that there's got to be some reward either within the activity, um, something, you know, innate that's just in the activity itself or attached to it. So that means it can be intrinsic, whereas the person just wants to do it for their own reasons or extrinsic. There's something round about that that is a, a pull to be involved in that. Um, and they believe that there's ways to create the conditions for optimum motivation. So that's kind of taking it away from the learner and putting it to us saying, right, we need to give them something that's going to bring, keep them engaged in this learning. So it might be, so if it was like intrinsic, it would be that the person, um, you know, just loves learning. I've got a brain there. So they might just love, they might go and do a, a course about um, social care because they want to help people and they just, 
they just love it and they're so passionate about it. Some people, they want a qualification. So even if they are bored as anything, they don't like the subject, they're plowing their way through it, they might just like, I really want this certificate because it's going to help me to do X, Y, or Z. Some people want to earn more money um, and that's their motivation for doing it. Some people might get money for doing a course and that's motivation as well because I know that if I, you're more likely to turn up if someone's paying you. So that, that's another idea of a motivation. Um, when you were at school, you might have picked a class because you fancied someone in the class. It, like, just that would be a motivator to go and study something or go and get involved in something. So there's all sorts of reasons why people will do something. And that's about rewarding them for being involved and those rewards being um, consistent and ongoing. So whether you've got a day course, it might be, um, you know, the motivator is that you're you know, you're really engaging and you, you're, they're getting to give their ideas and they, they feel important. That can be a motivator. So there's loads of different ways to motivate people. I work with really young kids and I'm amazed what they will, how much effort they'll put in for some stickers in the post. You know, it, it can be anything um, that's relevant to your learners. Um, constructivist approach. They feel like we need to build learning um, from where the people are at. So we need to understand where they're at in their life. And our own reality is a starting point for learning that we, we can't learn unless we understand it as part of our own life. Now that doesn't mean that we always, we reinforce people's like beliefs or anything like that. Because part of it, you know, if you were doing anti-racism training, where they're at might not be the place where we want them to be. Um, but we need to start with where they're at and understand that and, and show them that we understand that. Um, but this is we, that's a platform and we're going to help you build on that. So for example, when I taught childcare um, and early education, I got a group of school leavers in. The first thing I asked them was, who's babysat their wee cousin? Who's been taking their wee brother or sister to the soft play? Who went on a nursery to, for work experience? You know, so it's just, and again, that, that's nothing to do online. You can do that in any context. Um, you can do it on a one-to-one -one basis. Maybe before you get people involved in a group or a course, you can be in touch with them saying, oh, tell me a bit about yourself. It can be that simple. Um, so they believe that learning gets scaffolded from where you start. Um, so um, Jane Harter says, people will only want to engage if it is relevant to their needs or helps them solve problems. Um, and I, I would probably agree with that from my own perspective of going on a, you know, going on a course or being involved in a group. The next one is um, VAK learning styles. So some people have probably all heard about, oh, there's all different kinds of learners. Um, and these theorists believe that it's really beneficial to incorporate different kinds of learning into a program because some people are visual learners. Some people need to hear instructions and then go off and practice it. Some people need diagrams if they're visual. And kinesthetic, they need to move around, touch things, um, and actually just do it while they're getting taught. So obviously this, they, they believe that you should try and incorporate all different methods of learning in your course or um, in the group that you're running because different people will need different things at different times. Again, this, when we go on to talk about the challenges of online, you know, it's how, how do we do that online? Um, there is, there's ways around it, um, but it's not easy. Um, so an awareness of these things, we don't need to get bogged down in them, but it just helps you kind of think about, oh, how can I reward these learners? Where are they at just now? How is this going to be helpful for them? And, you know, is it going to be useful if we do something um, fun and practical team building things? Or do they want me to do a presentation? Um, unfortunately, I, you know, there's so many of us that I, I'm not able to do that today. But um, yeah, the, the goal of education is understanding and the goal of training is performance. So that's good to keep in mind as well. People are going on, when we go to school or college or university or whatever it is, I suppose we're wanting to get knowledge. Whereas if we go on a vocational course or we join a group, um, for a specific reason, 
we go on CPD, whatever it is, continuous professional development, whatever, the goal is we want to get better at something. We want to be able to do something. So people want to be able to leave that environment and go, now I can, for example, from my own, I, I did a, a music qualification recently. And for me, it was, right, now I know um, how to read that particular um, beat or that particular note. Now I can do that and I remember that and I can go and play it on the, the keyboard over and over again till I remember it. So that's that's kind of what it means. You want to be able to, everybody wants to go and train and, and go away and be able to do something. Yeah. So probably <laughs> probably learning about beha behavioral theory is not going to help you actually go out and create your course. So that's, but it, it's food for thought. So before we do this, I had a wee, I've got a wee question later on and I'm going to, um, I'm just going to put it up just now. So Jen, would you mind putting people into breakouts? Yep, no worries. All I need to know is how many people per room and for how long? We've got quite a lot of folk, haven't we? So maybe yep. five or four? Yep. And what, what we're going to do is we're going to have a little, 10 minutes, just having a wee look at, thinking about your own organisation, having a wee chat about what are the benefits and drawbacks of an online learning environment. And then when we come back, if, if some people want to share some of the ideas they discussed, that'd be great as well. So what are the, the benefits and what's the drawbacks? Basically, what's the positives, what's the negatives? Um, and you get 10 minutes. Look, brilliant, I'm just gonna open the rooms now. Hello. I think that's every- Oh, yeah. thank goodness. <laughs> Yay! <we're laughs> you're back. You get lost. And, um, so, yeah, that was great. Actually, I was saying to um, Martha and Suzanne, it's like the crystal maze when they used to come and like chat the door and be like, get out, get out of the room, you're going to... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, Jane, I'm going to um, bow to your wisdom of the best way to do this. I did want to hear back like verbally from people if they've got, if they just want, if there's anybody who'd like to feedback some of the ideas from their group, if they just want to do a wee a wee wave with their own hand or put up one of the emojis um, and then maybe me and Jen could try and spot you. I know we can't always see everybody on the screen view so but I can go yep. through and try and... Um, Linda's got her hand up. Linda do you want to come in? Yes, the question is where have I got my hand up? But that's another matter anyway. Um, <laughs> so I was I was chatting with Julie um, who works for Edinburgh Women's Aid. I work for Ash Scotland so that's Action and Smoking and Health and we both are used to delivering training face to face and there are obviously benefits of delivering online now which are a wider reach so I it, it's much easier now for people in uh, the Western Isles, Orkney, Shetland, you know more remote and rural places of Scotland to it's not easier for them to access but they're really delighted that it's basically leveled up the playing field they're not having to make big expensive decisions about coming to the mainland to, to, to attend training or us going there so, so not one way that's good. But what both Julie and I talked about is what we've, what we're really aware of is the amount of non-verbal communication that happens in a room, when you're in a room with people, and we're really missing a lot of those cues and a lot of the eye contact that you have. Because when you look at a camera, I'm looking to one camera, but it's looking to the whole room, and I'm not singling anybody out, and that's really quite strange. And we're also missing what I would call kind of the social lubrication which is all the chit chat that happens just around a meeting or around training. You know, when folk arrive, well, how was your journey? And oh, where did you get your coffee from? And oh God, that rain's awful, isn't it? And all that stuff that, that makes people feel welcome and included, you know, so I think that, you know, that's what I'm really missing. And hopefully, eventually, whenever, <laughs> whenever it's safe to do so, we'll be able to get back physically in rooms with, with other people because that's a, a huge thing and also the length of training it's two hours is what we usually deliver and usually face to face we would not have a break and people now are saying we want a break because it's too long to sit so that's my feedback i love that social lubrication because that that's such a great phrase and it's that's part of the learning as well that's what in mavi group that's what it's, that's part of how we learn and um as you say the, the equalities bit of it is like breaking down that's so so spot on um, 
good food for thought there, definitely. Is anybody else want to, got something they'd like to chip in? I saw lots of nodding when we were talking about the social cues and that kind of stuff, yeah. It's from a trainer's perspective as well, that actually is another social cue that they rely on as well to, you know, to, to know that your audience is understanding what you're saying. If you're presenting at the same time, you might not necessarily see everyone's screens and get the nods and the, the hmm and the note taking and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, Joe, I think, did Joe Fox, did you have your hand up? Yeah, just picking up on the um, short bursts of training, like, um, one one of the people in our group said that. Oh, oh we lost you. They would they'd really it was an hour over ten. Is that it's quite. Oh. Have you lost me? I can hear you. We now. did a little bit, Joe. Yeah. Do you want to just repeat what you said? Um, someone in our group was talking about a ten week course that they'd done, and my heart dropped. I thought, oh God, I couldn't do a ten week course. But because they were doing it an hour once a week, it was really enjoyable and they really engaged with it. So it's that, yes, you'd normally have a two hour training session. Um, but yeah, it's, it's having shorter bursts of training, isn't it? That's great. That's we also, know, yeah, yeah we, we felt that um, going digital, like you said, leveled the um, rural playing field. Um, so it's much more accessible. Um, but like you lose that connection don't you with people <clears throat> um we had a little bit of chat about what we were wearing um which is great it's quite a revelation really <laughs> <laughs> but um and we also um um one of our members in our group um does there was training with young people and he and he felt that boundaries were lower so you know he had one lad who would come on for a, a training session and keep switching the camera off because he was on his own and and that doesn't happen with face to face <laughs> so yeah quite it's great digital is great and, it, and it's something we all have to embrace but there are some limitations aren't there that's it yeah that's really really interesting what you're saying about switching the video off which it could be for some people you know like i know i do work with the scottish book trust and a lot of the trainings for teachers so actually an online training where they can almost like, they're probably like, right, I need to send that email or, a, you know, there's wee bits and pieces they can do, which depending on the learning, it could be a good thing. But yeah, is it, it's like, are people absorbed in it as much? If you can, if you've got all that temptation to fiddle about with stuff, you know? Mm. Oh, Lin Linda, I see your hand as well. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not wanting to do <laughs> dominate this or anything. Oh, yeah, I... I I'd stop my video because you can see my dog in the background and she's had a stroke and she needs to get up and wander about a bit from time to time. So that's why I switched mine off. But uh, the, the other thing I was going to say was um, that what I've discovered and we, we're just doing some test runs of our training at the moment. So we usually would deliver two hour face to face and we're adapting it for online and we're doing some test runs with some sort of critical friends at the moment, which has been really, really useful and really helpful. Um, but what's become really apparent is that in the normal face-to-face -face run of things, um, you know, you'd be talking about, you know, a document that people would have in front of them, and then they'd be back to you looking at you or looking at a slide or whatever. And it's really a lot harder to do that online because you're having to toggle between things. And I did it one way where I did a lot of toggling and a lot of swapping between screens and all the rest of it. And that felt really kind of dizzying, you know? And then I did another version where I didn't do that as much and it just felt really dry. And it was like, I was really conscious of just myself talking. And if people switch themselves on mute, it's almost like you're talking into a void and you don't just hear the ambient sound. So you've got no idea if people have died out there, you know? Yeah. So I find that really challenging. Absolutely. Yeah, it can be really off-putting and disconcerting, can't you? Like, Am I here on my own? Like, is, have I just, is everybody just disappearing that it's just me here? Um, so as a facilitator, it, it can be quite, um, you know, put you, really put you out your comfort zone. Um, maybe got a couple more minutes if anybody has got anything else or I can just, oh, Nick, I think Nicola Burnett had, had your hand up. Nicole. Nicole, oh, Nicole sorry. That's Nicole. okay, that's okay. Um, I, I, I'm working in the Mental Health Foundation and um, I, 
I'm in the Wales office, but heard about the training through the Scottish office. Um, so I feel like I'm infiltrating a little bit, but it's really interesting. Um, we, we've got a dads group um, and it was kind of part um, discussion, new dads transitioning to being a new dad and part football. Uh, and obviously we've, we've kind of moved to online. And I was just gonna bring up a couple of things because there are opportunities and, and drawbacks with that. And we found that we've um, lost some people but gained new people, like uh, Linda was saying, you know, in terms of being able to access the support. But equally, we've been able to develop um, a research consortium with quite eminent professors who I just don't think would have come, been able to across the country, but because it's Zoom and because it's an hour, they can drop in. So that's been part of our um, Work and Trust funding wanted us to do that. And we've been able, I think because of COVID, we've been able to do that. When it comes to the dads group and moving that online, one thing we have noticed is although they're very candid and open, um, there's been occasions where they haven't been able to talk because obviously if they came to the group, they were away from the house, away from their partner, away from the kids. Um, and now they're not, they're possibly in the next room or the same room. So they're, they're, they're kind of more careful about what they share and what, how they can share between each other because, you know, they might be talking Absolutely. about the house. Yeah. Oh, th thanks very much, Nicole. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, actually. I like that about get, being able to get access to people that we wouldn't normally, that's really interesting. So that's a good point actually about getting, you know, people that are like visiting speakers that might be really relevant to the people that are on your training or to your organisation. That's a great idea. And yet in this current climate, why not get in touch with people and give it a go? You know, absolutely. Um, I'm just having a wee look at the chat as well. Some great stuff in here. And actually stuff that, you know, some resources and tools that I've not included in this presentation that absolutely, Dropbox, yeah, I think that was, um, somebody said, um, Brian, um, Carla says she used Blackboard to collaborate. Um, so if there's a, anything in here as well, resources, I'll give Jen a list as well as some of the things I've mentioned. You will get the slides as well, but if there's anything else that comes up, it would be useful if we could... Um, I mean, maybe I could even open like a, a shared document and if you've got any ideas for things you've used, we could stick them in after today because I'd certainly be interested in diversifying my kind of repertoire of things that I use for sure. So um, yeah, that, that would be great. Loads of great stuff in the chat here. So if you do want to have a wee, again, it's this multitasking thing, isn't it? I was going to say, if you do want to have a look through the chat while the, the presentation's going on, um, obviously just have a look there's great stuff in here um, so I am going to go back to my slides if I can go to share screen um, hopefully when I do this oh yes it's, the, it's at the right place I'm not used to this happening um, although my, my keyboard's going all sticky again there we go so this is probably the bit we all want to get to is like how do we actually go about designing this? What is going to optimise our engagement? So this is a wee quote, technology does not equal innovation. We cannot expect different learning outcomes by digitising past practices. So basically, yes, we're using online, but let's find out what works for people. I know in the group that I was in, somebody said, at the end of the day, humans are humans, and it's people that we're working with. So let's think about what they need, how to motivate them, and build it around that. And there is so much technology that can enhance that. So the process, so that's your kind of big picture and the journey that you're going on. You and your learners are going on a journey. You're going to go through a sequence of activities um, and you've got an idea, a really clear idea about where they're going to take you. Um, and that's, you know, you'll be on a journey, whether it's a one day course, like an awareness session, or whether you're doing, as um, somebody said, like a 10 week course, there is a journey of training. Um, first of all, we need to think, what's the aims? However you're delivering that course, we need, you need to know the aims and the participants need to know. So that's probably, I know you, you all know that, but it's just worth kind of going through this process. Um, do you need to revise your aims in light of the current circumstances? So are you training community volunteers, for example, and has their role changed due um, to COVID? Um, in my group, we're talking about um, I had someone from the Scottish Refugee Council, a fantastic organisation, and the situation for refugees and how it affects their status, how it affects their wellbeing, that has changed. So, um, you know, how do we accommodate that? Whether you're 
you might be engaging with the refugees themselves or you might be engaging with um, people who you want to support them like that that's changing the way that many of you are what your aims actually are um, and process usually involves a particular style of engagement so are you going to do that flipped classroom thing where have you got a group that could go away and maybe they could come back and present something and you could um, do something like that are you going to do the real-time online course meet for an hour a week um, have you got materials you can share with them weekly meetings with a little home activity you know there's loads of different things you could do decide how you're going to do it um, earlier on I mentioned hybrid learning that's kind of like probably heard of blended learning which is a mixture of face-to-face -face and online so you might now be in a position where you can do some face-to-face -face with certain um, you know things around that, that that you have to follow certain guidelines so blended learning is maybe becoming an option again in that it wasn't even like a couple of weeks ago so things are changing fast which is it's the other difficult thing for us things are the information we're getting is changing so much that we're we're kind of not not quite sure what's going to be okay and not so online can be good in that sense and that do you know what we can keep using this no matter what happens if we have to all go back down into lockdown or you know something happens in our own organization where we're we're going through some organizational change if we develop some practices and systems we can keep using those so tools for running real-time workshops, lessons and sessions, which I think most people will do to some extent. So we're doing some of them today. You've got polls, Q&A, breakout rooms. There's whiteboards in Zoom. Um, there's, I, I was going to try and use some more stuff, but I think I'd end up feeling like a bit of a salesperson for Zoom going, oh, look at this, look at that. Um, you've got virtual classrooms in Microsoft Teams where people um, all the people can be like little emojis and they're actually all you create your own I don't know, emoticon or whatever it is and you're all sitting in the classroom together and um, the facilitators at the front so it can be fun but it probably when we're talking about those motivators especially for young people that could be a really good um, reward is that kind of fun element of it webinar function as well so in zoom and I think in teams as well and people are using other I saw in the chat there's you know zoom and teams aren't the only ones there's google versions and there's other things as well um if you can run a webinar that's basically like doing what i'm doing just now but everybody would join without video so you are only watching you're only able to watch and put things in the chat but it can be really good because you can record it and then people can access it again so you could put it up on your website you could put it in um, you could just share it with people via email as long as you can host it somewhere and um, you can share that and you can have it there for as long as you want so for example if you've got something that people always need to know like about a particular issue so um for example linda was from ash scotland so there's probably messages that they've got about smoking cessation and health that are always going to be part of their what they're offering people so you could have something that's relevant for years and um, yes yeah, so that that's always an option as well um, and this is just some tools and you know there's some of these we could do a whole session on these we could do a whole day session on a lot of these um, and I will open up a google document so that people can put things in because I've, I've heard even better ones today that I'm a bit like oh I wish I'd known about that because I would have looked really more brainy on this train <laughs> but um, some things that we can do um we can use this oh oh no that's not what i meant to do um we can use things like in instagram now and in facebook you can record voice memos so you could record voice memos and send them to people in between training and you can record the same memo and send it to different people so you're not having to like phone every participant um because some of the things about engaging yes we have maybe the the face-to-face -face training itself but in between times we still need to keep up that motivation as well that also depends on our capacity as organizations and in our own role but it's, if, if there's anything we can do in between times that's going to maximize your engagement and your retention of people in groups or on courses private groups can be a great way um, again if you're on there's a difference between doing that and if you're on facebook as an organization so if you've got a group for example, that are 
they're doing a course in community activism um, in a particular area, then a private group can be really good. It needs to be moderated though, so it, it can be worth saying to people like, um, X person's going to be coming on at very specific times and will answer your questions um, and obviously having kind of rules for the group. Just like, you know, that's what we all do in training though, isn't it? We establish the kind of boundaries or rules or a comfort agreement, whatever it is. So it's kind of the same. Padlet, somebody had already mentioned, um, that's great because, for example, again, if I'd used that today, you could all get a link and you could all write up your ideas on the Padlet and it would all be, I could display that in real time. Um, so that's great. And you can use that in, you know, when you're actually doing face-to-face -face training as well, you could have the screen up in front of everybody and their ideas come up there and then. So that's a really good real time um, tool. I've also just got a wee clapper board here, videos, just recording videos, might be able to share them on YouTube, uh, Facebook groups, whatever. If you've got something that people just need to know and you can make it kind of engaging and fun. Um, maybe even if there's anybody in your organization who has experience of animation or something like that, something that's going to impart just, especially when it's about awareness raising, if there's just something people need to know, that's a great way to do it. Anchor, if you're really wanting to get, um, if you've got time and the, the resources, it's a really easy way to make a podcast and at Mindwaves, that's what we use. Um, and we deliver training on that, um, how to make your own podcast. And a podcast could be 10 minutes long, but the, the benefit of that is, you, you know, you could, you could just record one conversation. Um, but Anchor's got things in it where you can do little songs and you can break it up into sections and you can publish it to all the different platforms, iTunes, Spotify. Um, so people can access it on any device um, though, if people have got a digital device, they will be able to listen to it um, on their their own preferred um, platform. Just got a cloud because just like cloud things like Google Drive, um, there's there's areas on Teams as well, and where you can store documents or slides or whatever it is or videos, any file sharing, Dropbox, um, where things are kind of cloud based are great. Kahoot. I don't know if MD's used this, but this is brilliant. It's just where you can go and design a quiz. You give people a PIN number and they can go on their phone and you can do the quiz in real time. Um, and it's got little quiz music and you can put in a name. So you don't need to put in your real name. So people could, even if they're off video and they, they do want to be anonymous, they could put in a, a nickname and you basically just, it's who can get the right question the fastest. And it's a good way to, for people to check their own knowledge as well, especially if you're doing online learning, you might not be able to go around and check everybody understands things, but Kahoot's a really, a really good way to, for people to check in with their own learning. And it's just really funny as well. It's really good. I used to use it a lot in, when I taught kind of school weaver groups in the college. And then going live, oh, going live on whether it's YouTube, Facebook, whatever, um, that seems to have been really popular. I know from speaking to some organizations, their stats for live broadcasts went up like amazingly um, from, I would say from between like kind of March and, and June, they had huge engagement through that. Um, it's starting to level off now because things are kind of easing up, but it, it's a great way to engage with people, especially if you you want to get a message out to lots of people, it's a great way to do it. Um, so analog tools as well, not everything needs to be digital to support digital learning. Um, sending physical materials to support activities. So I know a lot of organizations have been sending out art packs or, you know, if you were doing, and there's a lot of things about well-being going on in light of COVID as well. So, I mean, people maybe send them a little care package so they can talk about their health and well-being. Um, or it might just be some reading materials. And for some people, they might you might have to send people things because they need physical materials in a certain language or um, because of um, you know, visual difficulties or something like that. So there could be lots of reasons why people need physical copies. So that can be about engagement, but it can also be about inclusion as well. Phoning people up, just saying, how are you doing? You come to the training on Wednesday, it's good to see you. That always is nice, isn't it? Um, 
in reward materials, um, certainly for my, a lot of my experiences working with children and young people, but um, I mean, who doesn't love getting things through the post? Do you know what I mean? I love getting things through the post, so that, that can be quite nice if it's an actual physical thing rather than, you know, I've had a few things recently where I've done a little course and I've had to print off the certificate and I'm like, I'd rather get it through the letterbox and like be all proud of it. So yeah, the, these little things can make a difference. Um, done that. Um, challenges, we spoke about that. You've got that blurred boundary between your personal and formal space, having to wrestle your dogs, having to wrestle your kids. Um, bandwidth as well is an issue because if you've got five people in your house, if you're in a flat share or you've got family, that, you know, you, it can, you have an unstable connection. You have to look at yourself, which for a lot of people can generate a lot of like anxiety and things around self-esteem and stuff. And it, it's all, I mean, a lot of people have been making kind of jokes about this, but it can be really difficult and thinking about how other people see you. Um, social cues, absolutely, we've already spoken about that, especially for participants who've maybe got sensory or communication difficulties that make face-to-face -face difficult as it is. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I've got any solutions to that. I mean, I think maybe even thinking about speaking in a group and maybe coming up with some signs or some signals that you're going to use for certain things um, where it's not intimidating um, for people to do those. So there's there's a bit of clarity there. And, and what that is for different types of group would be different. Um, and one of the things we did speak about in my, the wee group I was in as well, which somebody else had brought up, um, you don't get those informal moments that you would have in a normal training course. And that's part of where the learning happens. Um, you don't get the breaks where you can go and say, oh, did you understand that bit? I wasn't sure about that. Or just getting more comfortable with people. So when you go back to the training environment, you're getting more relaxed as it, whether that's one day or whether it's a course, you're, the more social time you get to spend with people, um, the more you get to know them. Whereas for online, for some people, that, that, you know, that can be a challenge for people in a face-to-face -face environment where they find the social time overwhelming. So online might be great for a lot of people as well. Um, and also the less informal moments and not being able to pick up the cues. I was on a course recently and I found it incredibly difficult. I didn't understand it. It was about a, a software that I had to use. And because I couldn't speak to anybody, I was just sitting there going, everybody else must understand this. It must just be me that doesn't understand this. But if we had had a break, um, and face to face, I would have been like, oh my God, you know what you're doing? Or um, I would have, the facilitator would have seen me struggling and would have said, oh, you all right there, Marie? Can I give you a hand? But because of all these things, I didn't feel like I could really do that. And now I still don't know what I'm doing with it. So <laughs> I'll need to go in and watch some um, self-paced video tutorials about it. Um, so other challenges, Zoom fatigue is real. Probably in about another 10 minutes, this will be enough before we're all like, yeah, I need to have my lunch, need to go to the toilet, need to, you know, just have lie down in a dark room for 10 minutes. Doesn't feel like we're doing much, but it's tiring um, because all the things we spoke about, anxiety over the etiquette, like me in that course, I've now come away, I know nothing. It's not the person's fault. It's not really my fault. It's just, we don't know this environment. Um, yeah, we don't know if people are struggling or understand, so we need to find... There's ways around that. How do we agree with the people what we're going to do if we don't understand? Are we going to get in touch with people during the week? Are they going to give us a signal? Um, are they going to get in touch with us? Are we going to have a survey? What are we going to do? Um, and expectations of things like closed groups might vary. So, for example, some some people, I know in a, a couple, in my work, we're having team meetings and actually part of it is that it's just nice to speak to people sometimes because you do feel isolated, but there might be people who are expecting lots of engagement on a closed group, and there might be people that don't have time for it or can't participate in it for various reasons. So it's maybe saying like, what, what is, what can you really expect from, you know, the Facebook group? Um, how often can the moderator reply to you? People saying, well, I've, I've got. Um, childcare issues on these days, so you really you probably won't hear from me at that time. Um, it's just being clear so that people know um, what they can expect. 
Um, this was just a little case study I've got of my own experience. Um, so this was a group that I worked with. Um, they were a carers mental health activist group. And the aim was to empower carers to raise awareness of mental health stigma. And the format was weekly workshops, um, meetings and visits, um, going out to find out about different, um, different opportunities available to them. Um, they were motivated because they had asked for the content. They wanted input on housing benefits. They wanted input on um, mental health support available, all sorts of things. Um, we met weekly in person for two hours. There was loads of time for friendships to form. They were getting time away from their family responsibilities and housing issues. Um, they, we did practical activities like going to the museum and walking in the park. The participants loved cooking and they shared, they brought food and we shared it every week. We were in this, I mean the room was too small, but we were in this tiny room um, and it was hot, it was probably quite uncomfortable and it probably wasn't the best thing, but we were so close together you, you couldn't help but um, get to know each other. And we had staff who were um, bilingual, so people that could speak English and Urdu and Punjabi. Um, and that got over the barrier that not all the materials, so for example, people were coming in from different organisations to deliver things and we wouldn't always have materials available. So having the staff there that could just translate, like they could just sit down beside somebody and that was overcoming that barrier. So really the reason I'm sharing this is thinking about, you know, those people, there's a qualification involved in that. And it's like, what do we do? Is there anything online that we can um, do that can not replace those things, but can still keep some of those benefits and connections and learning going on? Is there, is there anything online we could do? And is there anything that actually, do you know what? There's just no way to replicate that online. Has MD got, can I just see if MD's got a wee hand to put up thinking about what could we, um, I don't know what happened with that group because I don't, um, I don't work with them anymore. But um, I, I'm, I'm just interested in what we would have done. Um, if anybody, don't worry if you don't have anything, but if you do have anything, stick your hand up. Oh, not seeing any hands, Marie. No, oh, we've good. got Kelly, Kelly, Kelly? And Anna after, after Kelly. Um, it might not work, I don't know how big it is, but on one of the digital facilitation groups I attended and with young people, um, before the Zoom group or consultation, they sent them out a little bag because normally at groups or training you get tea, coffee, biscuits, so they would send yeah. them out like a little sachet of hot chocolate, a little pack of biscuits, ah. just something nice so that when everybody came together, it's like, have you got your hot chocolate, have you got your biscuit, we'll just have a little chat, so it's it's nice. To include everyone and it doesn't cost a lot but imagine if you have a, a group of a hundred that wouldn't work but if you've got smaller groups and you have a small budget then you're able to do that well that's a fantastic one and then it's like you're still sharing the same thing at the same time and again who doesn't love getting sent stuff or getting delivered it's just lovely um and the, the the sense of belonging and value that people get from just that simple little pack i just oh that's a great example kelly thank you and there was somebody else, Jen, that you... Anna, did you want to come in? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's not dissimilar. Unfortunately, we haven't got, got the budget to be able to send things to people, but we've been holding virtual coffee mornings for our volunteers. Um, a lot of our volunteers are um, retired and therefore um, have been in you know, proper lockdown and um, therefore have missed that sort of contact with um, uh, the, the people that they normally work with. So if you cook, so we've been running these virtual coffee mornings and they come with a mug of coffee and a biscuit and it's absolutely fine to eat and drink whilst we are, whilst we're talking um, and we do some CPD for them so that they're keeping their skills together. But it's that whole thing about we're sharing the, the sort of experience of sitting around and having a brew essentially. Oh, see, that's brilliant, Anna. Thanks a lot for sharing that. I think that's a great idea for training. Um, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's, I was kind of thinking about this as well. And I was like, what would, if the, the group was still going, what would we have done? And um, I suppose I was thinking as well, like, because a lot of it was based around food, could we share recipes? Uh, you know, things like that. Or um, 
yeah, we can't go to do the, the art sessions at Kelvin Grove anymore, but could we get somebody from Kelvin Grove to do a little, you know, could we send little art packs out to people and they could run a session? You know, so also, you know, I know we've been able to access some additional funding to help with the barriers. And I think one of the things we would have needed to do was make it a priority to get any materials that we could in different languages and get those sent out to people. Um, also on PowerPoint, I know that you can record. So I could have, um, we're obviously doing this real time, but I could have done a PowerPoint and used the record function to, to say all this. Um, I wouldn't have been able, we wouldn't have had the interactivity, but um, you can record things. Um, so, you know, if there was things around, you know, people had reading difficulties or literacy issues, or there were language barriers, people could record on PowerPoint as well. Um, so just to finish off, just a few online training top tips. Um, I've got there, um, this is the weather for Blantyre, that's where I live. And I go in and check the weather quite a lot. And sometimes I'm like, oh my God, there's gonna be a heat wave in Blantyre this week, I can't believe it. And every time then I realize it's Blantyre, Malawi that I'm actually looking up, um, who have slightly better climate than us here in Lanarkshire. So my main tip, and from my own recent experience, especially of um, working with um, younger children, is being absolutely clear like about all those social cues. So much gets lost um, through nobody's fault, just because this is it, it's difficult, it's really hard. So I think that's my main tip, is setting clear expectations and boundaries and being exactly clear on what you're asking people, especially if it involves an instruction, just before you deliver anything, just be like, would I know what that meant? If, you know, if somebody said that to me, and um, cause that's where some of the challenges that I've faced is that I've maybe not, something's made sense to me, but does it make sense to, um, you know, a six year old or whoever it is that I'm working with? Um, giving people information in advance, or I love the idea of sending people out the packs in advance as well with their, their um, you know, the little things they could use to make the participation really nice. Um, providing options to share your opinions or demonstrate progress, because not everybody might want to, um, you know, not everybody might want to contribute. So some people here have been contributing in the chat, some people have been speaking. Um, I know that um, if some of my students, my music students are nervous about something, I use the, the voice, the, the recording memos and they can send me it so they don't need to play it right there and then. So there might be things around that for some people if, if they experience anxiety. Um, back up any written materials or verbal explanations. Um, and you don't always have to be the presenter. Can you get guests in if you know, you're thinking about that kind of flipped learning thing? Our participants, you know, if you're working with a youth group or your young people, have they got a presentation they'd like to do about something? Do they want to show you their dance that they've learned? What, you know, whatever it is um, that's relevant to your group, you don't need to always be the one that's center stage. What, how, how could you open it up and make it more democratic? Um, for ongoing courses, I think I've said this, factor in some kind of one-to-one the extent to which you can personalize that depends on how many people in your capacity. Some of these tools and methods you can use when we get back to training as well. So things like the Padlet, the Kahoot, using shared drives, all the rest of it. There's no reason why we can't keep using those in face-to-face um, -face situations. If you're having to record anything, um, don't stress over it. Aim for three minutes maximum. Nobody is expecting you to be like a professional broadcaster. Um, Plan it in advance, but don't worry too much about it. Um, don't worry about being perfect, basically. Um, aim for three takes. Um, I've had to record some material recently and my husband had to empty his phone because I because the memory didn't have enough because I kept going, do it again, do it again, do it again. So don't put yourself under too much pressure. And my last thing to say, I've got a video which we're probably just not going to have time for, but I will send to Jen. Um, and you can watch it in your own time. Um, audiences want people who, oh, <laughs> I need to move these all out the, the way. Audiences want people who they feel are just like them. Don't be perfect, just be real. Um, and that goes for online training or any other kind of training that you're doing. Um,
people know what it's like, the participants are experiencing it, your boss is experiencing it, um, your family are experiencing it. This is so difficult. You might, your job might have changed completely. There's people who study like masters in um, e-learning and, and digital technology for education. Um, it's their whole job. There's whole organizations, that's their whole, that's what they do. People come to them and they give them digital solutions. So really we, we can't put too much pressure on ourselves to do that. There's little things we can do. Some are digital, some are not, <laughs> that, that can help us to engage with people online, basically. This is a little video I was going to show you. I will, well, when you get the slides, you can, um, you can watch that. It's a guy called Sal Khan, who started off by making, off some, making some videos for his nephews, because they didn't think he was very good at explaining things on person. But he, um, so he made them some YouTube videos, and now he's got like a multi-million pound um, company who are um, doing education opportunities for people. Um, so it's, it's just to show you how maybe, obviously, I, just, I, I mean, I'm certainly not going to end up doing that, but it just shows you like a little seed of something. You could end up with an online program that is going to last for years from these little things you're doing. So um, just do what you can. Um, think about the principles that, that are behind what you're doing. And I'll open up for any, if anybody's got any questions, me and Jen will have a look. This is my Twitter, at Marie Lucy underscore one. You can email me. Again, these are on the slides. Just get in touch if you've got any questions. Get in touch if you've got anything you'd like to tell me as well that I've not included, because I would appreciate that. And I'll open up that um, Google document and just stick anything in there you want to tell us it's going to blow our minds and make our digital training amazing. So thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions? It's been quite a long time to listen to someone, so I do understand if you don't. <laughs> thank you everyone for popping your thoughts into the chat. I'm going to, I have added this into chat, but I'm going to share this chat as part of the, um, the follow-up. I'm just laughing. <laughs> Joe is a, if, if, if you've not seen it yet, go and have a look at Joe's message in the chat. <laughs> she's covering her face because she's embarrassed. Don't have a show and tell with your pets. My husband showcased an overweight grumpy cat and it weed on him live in a European wide video chat. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh my. Oh. Does cool. anybody want to jump in with some final thoughts, maybe about Joe's cat or <laughs> the session? Nope. Thank you so nope. much, everybody. It was great to. Oh, we've got somebody. Oh. There's loads of things popping up in the chat, though, so it will be good to share that with all your thanks. It's all your thanks in the chat just now. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. That's us just almost a half past, so we'll let you go. Um, I am just popping a little link into the chat just now, just to a really, really short feedback form. If you wouldn't mind completing that, it'll take you seconds. Um, and as I said at the top of the session, this is part of a series of sessions. We do have quite a few sessions coming up um, on various aspects of digital, including SEO. Um, Marie's doing more sessions with us, aren't you? Yeah, I've on got safeguarding. one, two weeks to do at the same time about um, creating safe online spaces. So it's kind of follow up from the environment part of what we were talking about. So it might, it might be relevant. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So you can sign up for that at thirdsectorlab.co.uk slash training. Um, and the last thing is I've started uploading the videos from previous sessions. Thank you so much for your patience. If you're waiting on one from a session that happened about a month ago, <laughs> trying to process an hour and a half long videos renders my computer useless. So thank you so much for your patience while I um, work through getting them up, but I'm, I'm making a good bit of progress with them now. So th they will sit on that um, that page of the website. If you scroll down underneath the event listings, you'll see them there. But um, yeah, unless you've got anything else, Marie, I think, I think that's it. No, us. just thank you everybody for coming. I really enjoyed um, getting to hear from folk and everyone. So it was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you everyone. Enjoy your weekend when it comes. Hopefully, um, it gets a wee bit less muggy in Glasgow. Thank you, guys. Thanks. I enjoyed it. Oh, Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye, all. Everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Marie.
Thanks, Holly. Thank you. No, thank you for coming.